A science story, huh? These NYU scientists, they I it felt, felt I really right. I was so and I just thought, well, I had figured it out. Wow. I it was like that tall. golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hey everyone, welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true personal stories about science. I'm your host, Eric Jankowski, and this week our theme is community. That safety net that can catch you when things get dark. The friends who will build you up to reach goals you might think are impossible. We've got two incredible stories on this theme, both touching on community and belonging in graduate school and beyond. Sadly, the way most graduate training programs are structured leads to graduate students struggling with feelings of inadequacy and exclusion. This has a name. It's called imposter syndrome. So first, a message to all you struggling students who feel like imposters. It's not your fault. Everyone feels like an idiot, like at some point they're going to be found out as a fraud, and it's because of the training systems we've built, not because of you. Second, we're glad you're here. Sharing and listening to stories about our struggles with belonging are an antidote. By being here together, we are doing the work of making our programs and our departments places where we can bring our full selves and grow together. Thank you for being part of our community. Our first story is from Andre Isaacs. It was recorded at Turtle Swamp Brewing in Boston, Massachusetts in November 2022. The theme that night was Catalysts. So my story begins 23 years ago, not in Chile, Boston, but in sunny Kingston, Jamaica. I was leaving my chemistry class um, in high school, and I was feeling pretty chilly inside um, because I just did really poorly on a chemistry exam. Now, you might wonder, why would a high school kid care this much about doing really well on a chemistry exam? Well, you see, growing up in Jamaica, we were all told that education was our ticket out of poverty. It was our way to elevate ourselves and our families to get beyond the cycle that was, for many, unbreakable. And here I was, sitting outside my classroom, unable to calculate how many moles there were in 10 grams of aluminum. I went home, I told my mom, I said, I'm sorry, but I don't think I'm going to be able to do well in chemistry or make this family proud. And she said, hush, hush, child. I am going to call your uncle. He will save you. My uncle was my father's brother, and my father really wasn't present in my life. He wrote a check every few months to my mother to support my sister and I. And my uncle, his brother, was well-loved by my father's side of the family. See, he had dropped out of medical school because he wanted to be an educator. And he started this this um, evening school for continuing education for adults and high school kids um, to help them complete their high school education. And I had to go to my uncle's class in the evening after school the following week to start learning how to do chemistry. So I went, I walked into the classroom, and there he was, standing in front. But what was really neat was not only was he standing in front, but he was making everyone laugh. Everyone was having a great time and I wondered, is this a chemistry classroom? And they all were having just a fantastic time. He came over, he said to me, I am just so happy you are here, and I really hope you um, participate in the joy of this community. That day, um, we were learning about oxidation, and he decided to share his opinion that Jesus was not given vinegar intentionally. They actually gave him an old bottle of alcohol that just so happened to oxidize to acetic acid, which is the main component in vinegar. And I was like, that is actually, it does make sense. And that was my introduction to oxidation reactions. I will never forget that ethanol goes to acetic acid. I developed this love for chemistry in its class. And the love for chemistry I developed wasn't because I needed to do it to save my family. It was because it was something I wanted to do. And so I got really close to my uncle. It was the first time in my life I had a male father figure around. I was there every day spending time with him. 
I also just found a community in a classroom of people who shared a love for science. And that was what kept us together. Unlike in high school when my friends or classmates made fun of me because I wasn't masculine enough and I wasn't like hitting on all the girls. Um, I was in a community where I felt like I belonged. And so the night before our big Caribbean wide exam, we were all at my uncle's high school. By this time, half my class was coming with me to get chemistry help at, in the evenings at my uncle's um, education school. And so we were there the night before, working problems, having a great time. This much fun should not be had in a chemistry classroom. <laughs> and at midnight, my uncle said, that's it, we're done. You are all ready. So we all left. He decided to take one student home. She lived in a really bad neighborhood and he was worried about her safety. So he said, I'm gonna take her home. The rest of you have rides. Good luck, see you all tomorrow. Break a leg. And so we went home. The next morning, I got up, went to my exam. I was really excited, waiting outside the classroom. They hadn't opened the rooms yet. I was like, let's go. And uh, my phone started ringing. And I looked at my phone. I'm like, why is my uncle's fiance calling me? Did he have something else he needed to say? And so I answered the phone, and she was crying. I said, Dorothy, Dorothy, calm down. What is going on? She said, Andre, your uncle was murdered on his way back from taking that student home. I was devastated, I was shocked, I went from hopeful to helpless in that moment. I did not know what to do. I sat in that exam room, I failed in spectacular fashion. My dreams were shattered. I did not go on to college that year. I got an acceptance at the University in Jamaica. I deferred my acceptance to figure myself out. I got really angry in the following months because there was no justice for my uncle. No one wanted to testify because they feared for their lives. And so I decided I was leaving Jamaica. I applied to colleges in the US and I landed in Worcester, Massachusetts at the College of the Holy Cross. And I decided to give chemistry another shot. I took my first exam. I was really nervous. And then my professor emailed me and said, you need to come to my office. And I was like, oh no, I'm failing my uncle. I went to his office and he said, you are a star. I said, really? He's like, you did extremely well on this exam. He's like, you should take this upper level class and you should think about going to graduate school. And in that moment, everything turned. I once again had the hope that I had lost. Someone believed in me. I kept doing well in classes and I went on to do my PhD at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. Things were going very well. I did so well on my first exam. I was loving the community I was building and the friends that I made. Uh, my sister came to visit me from Jamaica. We spent so much time. I came out to her, the first person I came out to, and she said, do not tell your mother. <laughs> she is so conservative Christian, you know she's not going to be happy. I was like, I'm not gonna tell her, it's fine. We took pictures, she met my then boyfriend, we took some pictures and she left, went back home to Jamaica. A few days later, my mother called me crying. She had found the pictures on my sister's camera, not iPhone, you know, we actually used cameras back then. And um, she told me, she's like, you are no child of mine. You need to repent. You need to find Jesus. She sent me Bible verses every day for the next year. I had uncles who stopped talking to me, relatives who, you know, didn't communicate with me at all. I lost a lot of friends and I fell into a deep depression. My work started suffering graduate school, and there has been this recurring theme in my life where mentors have really helped me up when I was down. And my PhD advisor saw that I was struggling, and he called me into my office, and he said, what is going on? You are not yourself. I told him all my struggles, what was happening, and he said, I'm sending you to San Francisco. <laughs> I have a collaborator there. Go. Um, you're going for a month. I'm going to book your hotel your room, you're going to work on stuff, find yourself, and when you do, come back. I went to San Francisco. It was a great time. I learned a lot of chemistry. I met a lot of people. <laughs> I came back, and I finished my PhD. I did pretty well. He connected me with a um, professor at University of California, Berkeley, so I could go back to California, and uh, spent two years there doing my postdoctoral work. 
Fast forward 10 years later to 2021. I am now an associate professor of chemistry back on my alma mater, the College of the Holy Cross. I, I told my students that they, if they dressed up for Halloween, I would give them extra points. I walked into class and surprisingly, 90% of them were dressed in Halloween gear. We laughed, we danced, we vogued, we recorded TikToks, we posted them online, and we've been building a community ever since. One that welcomes everyone, one that makes every student feel comfortable. And after that lecture, I went back to my office and I looked through the window and I said, dear uncle, I hope I made you proud. Thank you. That was Andre Isaacs, a native of Jamaica. Andre moved to the U.S. to attend the College of the Holy Cross, where he received his B.A. in chemistry in 2005. He received his Ph.D. from the University of Pennsylvania in 2011, and then worked as a postdoctoral researcher at the University of California, Berkeley. In 2012, Andre accepted a tenure-track position at the College of the Holy Cross. In 2018, Andre was promoted to the rank of associate professor with tenure. In addition to teaching courses in organic chemistry, Andre conducts research utilizing copper-mediated organic transformations. He is one of the members of Outfront, the college's LGBTQ faculty and staff alliance, and serves as faculty advisor to a number of campus student groups. And on a personal note, Dr. Isaacs is a Twitter hero of mine, and I aspire to bring a fraction of the joy and compassion he lives into my teaching and my mentoring roles. Okay, before we continue with today's episode, a couple of reminders. Tomorrow, on March 11th, we have a show in Boston at Turtle Swamp Brewing. Get your tickets and find out more at storycollider.org shows. Later this month, we have shows in Atlanta, New York, and Seattle. Again, that's storycollider.org slash shows for more information. And if you would like to learn more about how to tell a science story, check out storycollider.org slash education. We offer private workshops both online and in person for groups, and we offer public courses for individuals online as well. Our next public workshop is in April, and it's now open for registration. Sign up at storycollider.org slash education. Also, for more updates and cool behind-the-story pictures and other awesome content, you should follow us on social media. We're on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and now TikTok. Find us at Story Collider. And finally, if you're a fan of this podcast and if you, like us, believe in the power these stories have to reveal the humanity behind science, to change our understanding of how science happens and to whom it belongs, please consider donating to the Story Collider at storycollider.org slash donate. Also, if you're tired of listening to ads on the podcast, you can also sign up to our Patreon at patreon.com slash the story collider. Our Patreon supporters receive an ad-free version of this podcast, as well as occasional bonus episodes and other gifts. We are so grateful to everyone who helps make our work possible. What's the best way to learn a new language? Immersion. But sometimes that's not in the cards. But you can still learn a language the second best way, and that's with Babbel. Now, I might only be one week into learning German with Babbel, but I'm so excited to start being able to speak German with my mom. With Babbel, you can learn everything you need to have real-world conversations, and all it takes is just 10 minutes a day. One study found that using Babbel for 15 hours is equivalent to a full semester at college, which is bonkers. But Babbel is conversation-based learning with science-backed cognitive tools like spaced repetition and interactive lessons created by real language teachers and voiced by real native speakers. So here's a special limited time deal for our listeners. Right now, get up to 60% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners at babbel.com story. Get up to 60% off at babbel.com slash story. Spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash story. Rules and restrictions may apply. Our second story is from Joey Jefferson. It was recorded in a backyard peer space in Los Angeles, California in October 2022. 
The theme that night was expectations. A warning about content in this story, it includes a description of suicidal ideations. Early on in my life, I saw the world as a collection of boxes. Everyone had their place, and unfortunately, I didn't really fit into any of them. As a black man who grew up in environments where I was usually the only black man in the room, and a a bisexual person on top of that, my identity and belonging was always questioned, I felt. You're not really black. Bye now, gay later. This is just a phase. I heard these statements quite often. I wasn't aware, but these opinions, which I should have just ignored, profoundly affected me in my early 20s. Amid all this identity fun, I was given an amazing internship with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory Spitzer Space Telescope. The spacecraft used its infrared eyes to peek at galaxies, nebulae, and exoplanets as far as 13,000 light years away. It was magical. The job gave me a chance to learn how we sequence our program spacecraft, how to respond to alarms, antenna communications, and much more. But deep down, again, I felt I didn't belong. These people went to MIT. I went to Cal Poly Pomona. I was a math major. They majored in aerospace engineering. The feeling of exclusion began to creep up again and led me down a dark depression in a place literally focused on light. After some time, this feeling began to dominate my thoughts every day. I assumed people thought less of me as I walked down the halls and could hear snickering at my lack of knowledge in computer science, even though I was determined to learn. In retrospect, the odds of this actually happening was very low. But when you have low self-esteem, it can feel like the world is against you when it's not. I began to see and expect negativity everywhere. And after a night of drinking with some friends to escape this reality, I went back home darker than ever. I cried out to the world in anger. Why didn't I belong anywhere? So I made a decision to leave this dark place forever. I took every pill in the house I could find. And in the end, just waited for what's next, knowing that I might not wake up again. Surprisingly, I felt peace even though deep down I knew it was exactly the opposite. I woke up in a hospital room with my sister praying by my side. I was told I was going to be committed for 72 hours, which meant I was going to be hospitalized and able to leave until doctors were convinced I wasn't going to hurt myself again. Following the hold, I began to start intensive therapy, which did help, but that feeling of not belonging persisted. I couldn't shake it. After a few months, I was meeting um, to discuss my career with my uh, supervisor. I was 99% positive I was going to be fired. Commanding spacecraft takes mental fortitude, and I let it be known that I was struggling mentally. When the day of the meeting came, it felt like time slowed down as I got on my car and walked to her office. Einstein would be proud to know my inertial frame of reference was different from my peers nearby. And I'm not going to get into the theory of relativity, but that was actually kind of funny. (laughs) I still remember the smell of the flowers and that there was not a cloud in the sky. I wanted to take everything in because I didn't know if I'd ever be on JPL's beautiful campus again. I entered my supervisor's office sweating bullets, a picture of her family set behind her chair. And as she closed the door, the quiet was deafening. Each of her footsteps back to her desk matched my heart beating out of my chest. I said hello and immediately apologized for any headache I caused. She said it was okay and glad I got the help that I needed, but it was time to talk business. She said, we need to take you off the Spitzer mission and my heart immediately sank. I had been gone for too long, and they needed uh, to find someone else to monitor the spacecraft. To my surprise, she said, we found a place for you, though, on the Cassini mission, and you'll begin training next week. I was dumbfounded. 
In that moment, I knew how special an opportunity I'd been given, regardless if I felt I belonged or not. I was here now. The second chance meant everything to me. An average of 890 million miles away from Earth, Cassini was on a mission to explore Saturn and its diverse moons. Moons like Enceladus, with water jets spewing from a global ocean within cracks of its ice crust, or Titan, with oceans and rivers of methane surrounded by beautiful canyons. When I joined, Cassini was in its final year of her voyage to Saturn. So NASA pulled out all the stops, picture mission control from the movies. Everything felt historic on this mission. My role would be on the real-time operations team, watching over Cassini as it downlinked data, entered alarms, experienced issues with NASA's deep space network, and more. And after that year, Cassini was tasked to perform something no other spacecraft had ever attempted, known as Cassini's grand finale. After a series of 22 dives between Saturn and her rings, Cassini would crash and disintegrate into Saturn's atmosphere. This was chosen as an end of mission because Cassini exhausted all of its propellant during its 20-year mission. Crashing into Saturn ensured Saturn's potentially life-supporting moons were protected from Cassini, and the data collected as it touched Saturn would be groundbreaking. So on September 15, 2017, the grand finale arrived. The entire flight team was invited to sit on console as the last bits of data were emitted by Cassini. The visitor's area in the mission control room was star-studded, star and it seemed every news outlet in the world was focused in the room that we all sat in. Hundreds of Cassini's designers, scientists, and engineers arrived at Caltech to witness Cassini's final moments. The time trickled down slowly, but surely. And at 10 seconds to go until atmospheric entry, you could hear a pin drop across all of JPL. Everyone was focused on their telemetry and data. And out of propellant, Cassini was on her own. Finally, we lost the signal. Cassini successfully crashed into Saturn. Tears flowed and hugs were given as Cassini gave her last breath. And I smiled to the rest of the flight team, aware that we had a small part into something that was so amazing. And all of a sudden, I wanted to be here again. In the science community, in Cassini's community, the black community, the LGBTIQIA plus community, and eventually just all of humanity. I did belong. And more importantly, I was more than my mistakes. So I experienced two life crashing, two life changing events that year. Personally, I was able to gain confidence in who I am and celebrate all parts of me, regardless of the opinions of others. Professionally, Cassini cemented my love for spacecraft operations both Cassini's grand finale and my newfound confidence were 20 years in the making. I now know that there are no boxes. And just like the moons of Saturn, we are all unique, needed, and belong. That was Joey Jefferson. Joey Jefferson is a flight systems engineer at JPL operating the Soil Moisture Active Passive SMAP and NEOWISE spacecrafts. Prior to his current position, he worked with NASA and foreign space agencies conceptualizing, negotiating, implementing, and monitoring their antenna strategies over the deep space network. An international award-winning pianist as well as a singer and clarinetist, music will always be near and dear to his heart. The Story Collider is so grateful to Andre and Joey for sharing their stories with us. The Story Collider is also very grateful for the support of Science Sandbox, a Simons Foundation initiative dedicated to engaging everyone with the process of science. This podcast is produced by Aaron Barker, executive director and co-founder of The Story Collider, with help from managing producer Misha Gajewski and senior podcast editor Jen Chen. Special thanks goes out to Story Collider's board and the rest of our staff, including Managing Director Anne-Marie Lonsdale, Science Advisory Fellow Edith Gonzalez, Education Director Lily B., and Operations Manager Lindsay Cooper, 
without whom none of this would be possible. The stories featured in today's episode were produced by Catherine J. Wu and Bart Thompson and by Brian Kett and Leslie Burnson, respectively. Our theme music is by Ghost. Next week, we'll be back with more true, personal stories about science. Until then, thanks for listening. Thank you.